Welcome back to Selected Shorts. I'm Cynthia Nixon. For more information about the stories you're hearing, the readers who are reading them, or about the Selected Shorts writing contest, you can go to SelectedShorts.org. And please write and tell us what you think of today's program. Our second story about odd combinations was also part of our Radio Love Fest program at BAM. It's by Paget Powell, an author with a quirky sense of humor. He likes to imagine couples who are misfits fitting together. In this case, it's Janis Joplin and Charles Dickens who meet in the third grade. And that's really all you need to know, except that there are a few playful and indirect references to body parts. John Cameron Mitchell reads Joplin and Dickens. Janis Joplin sat at her desk and regards Charlie Dickens at his and wonders, that boy could be the answer or one of the answers to the long question that will trouble her, will I be the loneliest girl on earth? The dog of loneliness is already at age nine nuzzling her because it is, after all, a dog and nuzzling and she nine. The dog of loneliness nuzzling little Janis Joplin at this point is merely cute. It will not be so cute later when she has bad skin and has wrecked her voice and swings that bottle of Southern comfort at it as it tries to lick her face all sweaty on stages. Oh my, this is poetic. <laughs> Let's abjure poetry because the conceit of this Janis Joplin and Mr. Dickens, a century out of his time, is already inane. We will stick to the facts and try not to be pretty. She has heard Charlie Dickens use pretty, big words early in the third grade. Unlike other children, she has not been inclined to roll her eyes at him when he deploys a doozy. Even the teacher has rolled her eyes or done that thing where she takes a deep breath and lets it out and says, okay, Charlie. <laughs> Can you state that in other words? <laughs> to this, Charlie has said, in other words? <laughs> Seeming to be honestly perplexed, it is clear to Janice, at least, that he is not dissembling to use a big word that cannot properly be in her brain either. What she means to think is that Charlie is not pretending not to understand the teacher when she wants other words instead of the perfect ones he has apparently just used. Janice assumes them perfect anyway because she doesn't know herself their meaning and she will give the benefit of the doubt to a boy in pleated short pants with his hair wet combed and speaking clearly without giggling or mumbling. She would like to mount Charlie Dickens. <laughs> in the cloak closet if she has to. But in the bushes right outside the windows on the side of the school facing the orphanage where he lives would be better. <laughs> It is not usual for a nine-year-old girl to have visions of mounting people, but Janice is not a usual girl. Charlie, for his part, is unusual too. He is about giving up talking in class, participating in the teacher's notions of good pupil citizenry, because it is clear she does not really like good pupil citizenry, or she would not be inhaling and sighing like that and asking for other words. Last week, he said, crazy wooden galleries common to the backs of half a dozen houses with holes from which to look upon the slime beneath. Windows broken and patched with poles thrust out on which to dry the linen that is never there. Rooms so small, so filthy, so confined that the air would seem too tainted even for the dirt and squalor which they shelter. Wooden chambers thrusting themselves out above the mud and threatening to fall into it as some have done dirt besmeared walls and decaying foundations, every repulsive lineament of poverty, every loathsome indication of filth, rot, and garbage, all these ornament the banks of the ditch behind the orphanage in which I am not alone confined. <laughs> he thought he had got it about right. <laughs> Until the teacher then said, can you, Charlie, sigh, say that in other words? 
I'll try, he said, but later. And he sat down because he was winded. And he did not think he knew other words. And he saw Janice looking at him in that way he had no words for yet. He tried later that night to formulate words, not other than those he had used to describe his mean privation, but to describe the kind of looking at him Janice Joplin did. It was shy, spittily, askance when not directly at him, diffident, not shy, he thought, perhaps sidelong. rather than the awkward askance when not direct. Spitley was terse, but not elegant. Better to string it out with a little goblet of spit in the corner of a mouth as if she were hungry. <laughs> Janice did look hungry, but not in the way his peers at the orphanage looked hungry. They looked like they wanted to eat Twinkies. Janice did not look like she wanted to eat Twinkies. Janice had this odd way of looking like an old woman Sometimes an old woman in a bed, like Miss Havisham. <laughs> a woman he could see in his mind, the vision of whom mystified him. He did not know who it was or why he had a name for her and could not recall anyone remotely like her in his life at the orphanage outside Austin, Texas. On television, Janice has seen an interview with Ray Charles that has made her interested in Ray Charles and indeed in music itself in a way that she was not interested in either Ray Charles or music before she saw the interview. Mr. Charles had on magnificent gleaming sunglasses and he rocked his head around in the air like a bird dog looking for a scent which she knew he did because he was blind or was supposed to be blind. Too many singers claim to be blind for them all to be blind, <laughs> she thought. But she thought Ray Charles was probably not lying. <laughs> About that. <laughs> if anything made her suspicious of his blindness, it was simply how good his sunglasses looked. They had gone to some trouble getting those magnificent glasses, movie star glasses that could have been on an Italian actress if they were not there waving around like solar antennae on Mr. Charles' face. Anyway, right out of those glasses came this white, sizzly, blinding light into her own eyes as Mr. Charles said, you can only make love to one woman at a time. That remark transfixed Janice. She did not know why he said it or, or, or what he had been saying or what the question was. In fact, she did not know really what make love to a woman meant, let alone one at a time. But it was the idea that held a great appeal to her, clearly up there on the tree of adult knowledge. And when he said it, she knew he was not lying about being blind or about being a good singer or about being a good singer being a good thing to be, though she did think he might be lying when he said you could only make love to one woman at a time. <laughs> it sounded like he was denying something <laughs> rather than just stating a fact whatever the fact was or whatever the denial, she could eat two apples at the same time. I mean, it was dumb because they both turned a little brown as you did, but you could do it. I mean, she wondered what in fact there was you could do one of that you could not do two of at one time. She could sing two songs at one time, five. She did this in the bathtub, and she mostly did it when she forgot lines to one song, but remembered those to another. But sometimes she did it for fun. Ray Charles was not on the level about that woman thing, but he was guarding as being on the level about that music thing. She thought, what if I be Ray Charles on the music thing and myself on the woman thing? 
I'll say you can make love to more than one woman at a time. She already sang pretty well in the bathtub and no one ever told her to pipe down. One reason she thought she might be pretty good. Jose Feliciano, Stevie Wonder, Ronnie Millsap, and Ray Charles. It was too much. <laughs> At Blind Lemon Jefferson, she gave up. <laughs> Charlie Dickens raised his hand when the teacher asked someone to describe the weather. Most of the children had merely looked out the window, begun forming the notion that it was so obvious what the weather was that either the teacher was trying to trick them or was retarded. But Charlie <laughs> was the kind of kid that would step into a trick with a smile and save them all from it. You know, despite his weirdness, they liked him. Many smart Alex you despised, but Charlie was so far out there, you could not despise him for being smart. He was some kind of Twilight Zone smart, and he would use it, as in the present weather trick, to protect them all. <laughs> the weather. <laughs> Charlie was saying, implacable November weather. <laughs> as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. And it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus <laughs> waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill, smoke lowering down from chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. <laughs> Dogs! Indistinguishable in mire, horses scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers, foot passengers, Charlie. No, ma'am, I cannot put it in other words. <laughs> very well. Good job. <laughs> you may be seated. Children had been on the verge of erupting in a kind of excitement she had not seen of them before. Perhaps it was the Megalosaurus. <laughs> they had helped to resist the force of Charlie Dickens before this adventure, but now it seemed they might be swinging to him. And if they wholeheartedly began to support Charlie's flights, her classroom could go completely out of control. The only child who seemed self-possessed, actually, was little Janice Joplin, who had calmly studied Charlie through this weather broadcast without squirming or giggling or otherwise beginning to vibrate to his lunacy. <laughs> Ms. Turner, as she was known to the children, was a private woman with an interest in biology that had gotten derailed. She had not gone to graduate school, as she had hoped, and now found herself inexplicably wrangling the small herd of mostly privileged children. She was fending off the unwanted advances of a coach from the middle school next door, <laughs> a man who came round in polyester stretch pants and expensive-looking noisy athletic shoes trying to talk her into going out. That was an ordinary nuisance, except that he, the coach, somehow reminded her of ordinary little Janice Joplin as she, Janice, sat there regarding the extraordinary Charlie Dickens. Ms. Turner had noticed the special regard Janice had for Charlie, and she knew what it was about. As phantasmagorical as that seemed for a child of Janice's age, she was a sexual predator as surely as Coach Leach. <laughs> Richard Leach labored under the appellation Dick Leach, which did not make his life any easier. <laughs> In a kind of blinding fatalism, Ms. Turner saw that her life was already fixed in this nothingness she was in, and she was not to escape it. This vision made things paradoxically a little easier to take. She might as well relax and settle down. Thus, she had come to let Charlie Dickens, for example, go on a bit more than she once had. 
short of his precipitating a riot amongst his peers with his performances, which struck them as tours de force of authority thwarting or nose thumbing. They could not, she didn't think, distinguish between smart Alec and smart. As we have seen, she was wrong in this surmise. She could not know that the children sensed their own mundane trappedness there as she sensed hers and that they divined in Charlie Dickens's excesses a chance that he would by them escape and go into orbit. They themselves would be denied. He was among them a kind of early astronaut, and they liked astronauts of all kinds. <laughs> she was wrong, too, in her apprehensions of Dick Leach's interests, because Dick was as homosexual as balls are round. <laughs> but Dick Leach is not within the scope of our concerns. Forget him. <laughs> Let's forget Ms. Turner, too. Things are happening. A girl quieter than even Janis Joplin, if that is possible, named Gail Crutchfield, who lives at the orphanage with Charlie Dickens and who wears the most out-of-date clothes the orphanage has to hand down. Today, a long red plaid dress belted at the waist with a belt of the same material. <laughs> this makes her look like a Rockwell mother in 1940. This Gail Crutchfield, who has not opened her mouth heretofore in any enterprise, in or out of class, is standing up in her desk chair, smoothing down her dress and wringing her hands nervously. She's breathing as if to prepare for something she has to say. She begins then not to talk, but to sing and to sing well, powerfully well. At first, Ms. Turner doesn't know the song, Hank Williams, Your Cheating Heart. Then she's amazed she has heard it her whole life and never heard it like this. Coming from the mouth of an 11-year-old Gail Crutchfield, Gail's been held back and is older than the other children. It is spectral, not at all bumpkin as Ms. Turner had assumed it before. Gail Crutchfield loses her nervousness entirely once she begins to sing. She concentrates on every note and hits every note with authority and uses a yodeling tremolo or <laughs> vibrato where the song wants it. Ms. Turner doesn't know the musical term. When she is done, the children who have been fidgeting, making small efforts to distract her, a couple of paper balls have flown by her head, start howling derisively, clapping and booing at once, and Gail sits down, primly folding her hands and erectly staring forward with one red-faced glance at Ms. Turner as if to apologize for interrupting the class. Gail Crutchfield seems embarrassed to have interrupted the class, but not to have sung the song. She says, to whom Ms. Turner cannot say, well, you asked me to. <laughs> this is the first and only hint as to how this performance has come about in her classroom. Gail Crutchfield has not received any notice from Ms. Turner before this moment. Beyond that, she lives with Charlie Dickens and a boy named Martin at the orphanage across the street. Ms. Turner is beginning to suspect that weird things are afoot in this room. She occasionally has the sensation that she's on a bus and doesn't know where it's going and hasn't even known that she's on a bus. That's how out of it she is. The phenomenon of Gail Crutchfield this morning has put her in a strongly bozo on the bus frame of mind. As he walks by the outside of the classroom after school, Charlie Dickens is whispered to loudly from the bushes under the windows the children stare out of all day. In the hedge is Janice Joplin, <laughs> squatting down and hooking her finger at him. He goes in. Hey, Janice says, and he says, hi. She kisses him wetly about his face. He's overwhelmed by her into a sitting position, legs straight out, Janice on all fours going messily at him. My girl. 
he finally manages to say, you have laved me as a dog so starved for affection might confuse flesh for its proper food. <laughs> he is smiling because the odd displeasure of his cold, wet face in the bushes outside the classroom, which should put him, he thinks, in an ill humor, is not putting him in an ill humor. Janice, for her part, is certain he's called her a dog. <laughs> a thing she could have predicted, but notices that Charlie Dickens is smiling. This she points out. You're smiling, Charlie. Indubitably. <laughs> And inexplicably, the confluence of our salivas I'd not have predicted could be less than odious, but it is. <laughs> this world is strange, Miss Joplin. You're from the Baptist home and you are the smartest boy in school, Charlie. That is strange to me. Well, Martin is smart in his way, and we must consider the early talent of Miss Crutchfield. <laughs> what did you think of her today? Janice Joplin wonders how a boy who insists on wearing a trench coat and who clowns around all day and who once ran and slid baseball style under a table when Miss Turner was out of the room and because under the table his feet touched a dead bird none of them had seen before that must have come in from the window had died in the night, stood up quickly announcing, I killed a bird. Janice wonders how such a boy can be smart in his way, in any way. <laughs> she wonders if Charlie Dickens is not being kind, as adults seem to be and want children to be, instead of picking on each other as they deserve. <laughs> and all of this wondering she would prefer to do there, still on her knees and hands over Charlie Dickens, just like the dog he has called her rather than think about what Gail Crutchfield did today in class, a thing that excited her and made her mad also because she'd been working on something like that in the bathtub. <laughs> not that song, which she knows is a Hank Williams song, and not, as she thinks Gail Crutchfield probably thinks, is a Patsy Cline song. This she can tell from the way Gail sang it, kind of all bossy instead of scared and shaky as Mr. Williams sang it. How to tell Charlie Dickens all this on her hands and knees in front of his face, the smartest boy in the world. I've been singing in the bathtub a lot, she says, finally. Charlie Dickens regards her for a long time, just exactly as if he is thinking some large word things up that cannot be put in other words. You sing in the bathtub, Janice, if I may be familiar. He says at last, and I'm afraid that I wallow in the slough of despond. <laughs> I am apparently not coeval with my time. <laughs> no, you are not. <laughs> Janice says, meaning by it nothing that Charlie can be certain of. He does not expect that she can understand him. He suspects she means that she does not deem him evil. And this is good enough and does not merit an explication of his inveterate, inscrutable, ineluctable way of speaking, since that impossible speech is primarily what he's talking about. I don't fit in today, he says, but you do, as shy as you seem and as troubled. Your desperation is within reach of its targets. I mean, Miss Joplin, mine, mine is not. Mine is well lost. I feel, in other words, they both giggle. Very old, somehow, and you are very young. My desperations are behind me as odd as that may sound, and yours, yours are ahead of you, yet to be discovered. This relaxes Janice. She can see herself kissing him again and singing in the tub 
and singing, standing on our own desk chairs, showing them the weak and shaky and real way to sing songs. I want to have big boobs and blonde hair, she says. <laughs> Charlie Dickens shakes his head ever so slightly, like a wise man. Like some grandfather in the cutest short pants who lives in the Baptist home, Janice thinks, you might want large breasts, Janice, but you do not want blonde tresses that are fine and flaxen because, well, it is a hard matter to put delicately, but men do not want, in spite of all their proclamations to the contrary, to see Johnny Winter down there. <laughs> Excuse me, I... I I mean Edgar. They do not wish to see Edgar Winter in the perturbations of their rut when they are weak with need and not ready to see Edgar Winter. <laughs> Down there. Down where? In other words, in your pants. Charlie, you are too weird. <laughs> Who is Edgar Winter? You will learn who he is. <laughs> you will make a mock. You are so smart. You will be famous, Charlie. No, quick child, I think not. I, it is improper, at least, or at least it would play verily at the edges of the field of impropriety for me to burden you with my troubles. They are vast. As I've intimated, I am an old man, somehow, ill-befitting this age and my age. The, this will precipitate in me a long degrade of faculties, which I believe is called a nervous breakdown. <laughs> you will have one of those too. <laughs> but your taper burns at the other end, as it were, the correct end. Mine burns at the base. Janice giggled at this speech, and with it, Charlie began to struggle to his feet and Janice let him get up. In two months' time, third grade would be over. <laughs> she would have kissed Charlie Dickens two more times, and he would disappear over the summer and not be in school in Austin, Texas for the fourth grade. She would discover the books written by Charlie Dickens and hear Grace Slick on Johnny Carson say, I would have blonde hair and big boobs when he asked her, if you could do it all over again, what would you do? <laughs> She'd see both Johnny and Edgar Winter play their guitars in Port Arthur, sing herself well beyond the bathtub, and never properly be as much in love as she was the day Charlie Dickens told her all that he told her in the bushes outside the classroom his cute boy knees, and his difficult man mouth. John Cameron Mitchell performed Joplin and Dickens by Paget Powell. I'm Cynthia Nixon. Thanks for joining me for Selected Shorts. Selected Shorts is produced by Jennifer Brennan. Our radio producer is Sarah Montague. The readings are recorded by Miles B. Smith. Our programs presented at the Getty Center in Los Angeles are recorded by Phil Richards. Our hosts are recorded with the generous support of CUNY at the City University of New York radio station with sound engineering by Sarah Fishman. Our mix engineer is Joe Plord. Our theme music is David Peterson's That's the Deal, performed by the Deerdorf Peterson Group. Support for Selected Shorts is provided by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, publishers of the best American short stories, edited in 2015 by T.C. Boyle. Additional support is provided by the Dungannon Foundation, sponsor of the Ray Award for the short story, the Henry Nias Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, Seedlings Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts.
Zabars.com is a proud sponsor of Selected Shorts. Zabars.com delivers New York original toasting bagels, coffee, smoked salmon, babka, and more throughout the 50 states, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Visit them on the web at zabars.com slash shorts. Additional support for this program comes from this station and public radio international stations nationwide and from the PRI Program Fund. Selected Shorts is produced by Symphony Space and is distributed nationwide by PRI, Public Radio International.